too. Uh, hi, I'm Alistair McLennan. I'm I'm here with my uncle Kevin Russell Cox. We're at uh, 46 Girawen Avenue on the 6th of December, uh, 2020, pandemic year, very auspicious. Um, so Kevin, when, when were you born? I was born on March the 8th, uh, 1931, mm -hmm. at the Blackburn Private Hospital, which is on the corner of Gordon Crescent and Clark Street. Yeah. It later became a nunnery, and I don't know what it is now. And uh, yeah. my parents lived in uh, 48 Main Street, Blackburn. It was later renumbered to number 50. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a Californian bungalow that they bought for a little under a thousand pounds in about 1930. Mm -hmm. They had it built new. So that was straight after they were married? It was very soon after they were first married, yes. Yeah. And they, um, they lived there for many, many years. Yeah, they did until the... Um... 80s, I guess, or maybe the 70s. Yes, I think 70s. it was the early 80s, yeah. uh, and uh, about 1984 or thereabouts, they moved into a retirement village at Baxter. That's right. Um, on the Mornington Peninsula. Yeah. And now, when so when you were born, uh, living at the house was um, your mother and father, which is my mutter and pop. Yes. And uh, Umpy, your grandfather. Yes. Umpy uh, was um, uh, Gustav Wilhelm Beer. Uh, he was born in Collins Street, Melbourne. He, his father was a German, mm -hmm. Johann Amundus Ernst Beer. And uh, he came out, he was a bootmaker by trade, and he came out to Australia to, to try his luck in a new country. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, um, he wrote a wonderful... Uh, he kept a wonderful uh, journal, yeah. and um, it's currently in the, um, the State Library of Victoria, mm -hmm. together with other artefacts that he left behind. Yeah, and and so Umpy, at, at that when you were born, he was um, he would have been about sixty odd, or or maybe a bit oh, older. He was about seventy five, I think. Seventy five. Mm. Yeah, he he died in. Um, it was in 1950, I think. So, yes. so he he lived basically in, in the family home for um, for quite a few years. Oh, and, over ten years. Yeah, and so uh, and so he was born in Australia, but from you know German stock. Right. Did did he speak German at all uh, yes, with you he, when he was... he spoke German mm. and uh, he taught me German. I could apparently speak German up until the age of about five when I went to school and no one wanted to know uh, about German-speaking people uh, <laughs> at school. So it was a bit of a dodgy period. That was the end period. of German, but uh, with me. But I, um, I went to Germany some years later and it was amazing how it came back again because I, yeah. I went out shopping with a cousin's wife yeah. um, at a little, well, it's not a little place, Bad Kreuzstark in the Rhine yeah. province, mm -hmm. and uh, she couldn't speak a word of English, and uh, but I was able to communicate with her. So in German, very good. Yeah, well, and waving mums around, and yeah. And can you can you describe Bumpy? What, what did he look like? Was he tall or short? No, or... he was a short man. Yeah. He um, he was a very versatile person. He he and, and he was very fit uh, as a young person. He was a fireman. Yeah. Um, but he, he had a whole series of occupations. He was a photographic retoucher. He was a, quite a wonderful artist. Mm. Um, he um, um, oh, so he did sketching. Yeah, yeah you mean? yes. Oh, and yeah, oh, okay. Yes, he was um, very articulate. He wrote poetry, and um, he had a very good command of the um, of the. Um, well, he spoke English perfectly, but yeah. obviously born here. But going back to Germany for, for several years, his, uh, his German was, was good too. Mm. 
Um, someone once told me that it was copybook German uh, circa uh, the late 1800s. Oh, okay. Because yeah. languages evolve, they change yeah. with time, and his German was dated. Yeah. Uh, Mum, Shirley, your sister, yeah. just to introduce, um, she, she has some of, the, some of um, Umpy's uh, exercise books and the, the writing, you know, the, the writing in German yeah. is, uh, is fantastic. Okay. It, it looks like he, he spent probably most of his uh, school, school time was in Germany rather than in Australia. Oh, so, yes. Yeah. So he was quite young when he went to... Germany and then so it, uh, after he spent his school years in Germany then he uh, came back do you know what how old he was when he came back to Australia well he came he went back to New Zealand and he um, I think he was only about 18 or something like that mm. um, and he got married in New Zealand to a widow um, and uh, they had she had a couple of three children, I do believe, before they got married, mm. and uh, then the, they had a between them they had um, three other children, and um, there were twins. There was um, Letty and John Proctor, mm -hmm. beer, and uh, the other. The other um, son was um, Rudolf. Oh, R Rudolph was um, Mutter's uh, brother. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It, so there were virtually two families. Yeah. But there's a bit of a cloud over Umpy because um, apparently when he left New Zealand to come back to Australia, um, he left the twins uh, behind, um, and um, Auntie let. Uh, was rather she didn't like him very much and mm. was rather bitter about him actually I found him a very sweet old man mm. uh, but he um, what, what did Auntie Let say about him what, what did what did she say uh, well she didn't really like men very much <laughs> in, in part okay. I, I suspect that, uh, that she um, she had other tendencies but she was a um, she just didn't like him at all. She felt mm. that he had, uh, I won't say abused her, but neglected her. Yeah, well, uh, I guess leaving her, yeah, leaving her in New Zealand yeah. when she was a baby, that was a traumatic time. I think what happened was that when he got back to Australia, his father said mm. to him, you get him back over here. Mm. And uh, that happened, so that the whole family came over here. Yeah. They ended up settling in the um, South Yarra area. Yeah. Years yeah. later, Umpy had a um, tobacconist shop and library. I've seen I've seen the address. It's ninety three Turak Road, okay. um, South Yarra. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you remember going to that shop, or no. you know, after he uh, no. you never visited? But he did point out where the shop was. Right, mm. and it was still still a shop at that time. Yeah. Yeah. I used to go to um, go to uh, with him on pension day. He'd go to. South Yarra on Pension Day and collect his 10 shillings or whatever it was at that time, it wasn't okay. very much. And he would um, visit his friends there. Um, one of them was um, was at the, the funeral parlour, Matthew's funeral parlour and, and various other people that, uh, that, he, um, that he knew. Yeah. Now you said, so Ump Umpy married, it was Leticia Rance in yeah. New Zealand. And you mentioned before that um, you used to visit with Umpy uh, some rancers in in Melbourne as well. Is that right? In in, in Melbourne, yes. Yeah. There was a, a Charlie Rance, and um, I can't think of the name of the other one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Charlie and. Um, I'm sorry, I don't recall. And and were they? Do you know if they were um, sons of uh, Leticia? Or... I, I don't. I can't fit that one together. Yeah, it I could can't. it could just be a coincidence. And I doubt it. I, I think that there, there must have been, have been some definite. The mere fact that 
so many of them came back to Australia. The yeah. living conditions in Australia must have been better than they were in New Zealand at that time. Yeah. So I suspect that they would have been um, uh, part of a group of people that came over here mm. for economic reasons. And then in 1933, uh, Shirley was born? Yes. Right. And uh, so you're st still in um, 48 or, or 50 Main Street? Yes. Um, at, at that, like, I'm, I'm sort of remembering back in the 70s when, the, you know, the house was there and uh, Mutter and Pop was still living there, and, and but half of the house was uh, rented out. Um, so at that stage, it was, it was only uh, the, the family and Umpy uh, living there? Well, Umpy would have, he, uh, he had died by then. No, he, 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 Umpy died in 1950, so oh. I'm talking about before that, you know, oh, when, you when Shirley, 70. no, when, when Shirley was, uh, was when Shirley oh, was yes, born. Oh, yes, Shirley, yeah. yes. Yeah, well, Umpy lived in a little uh, bungalow at the back of the house that had previously been um, uh, a woodshed and um, and laundry. Yeah. And um, mm. uh, Dad had it converted into a, a bungalow and he had a... Um, a bed and a, um, a chest of drawers and various other things in it and a, a yeah. toilet. Um, sewage had come um, to Blackburn and uh, the nightman, um, nightman's reign was over and uh, he um, he lived in this little bungalow for several years, yes. Yeah, I remember, yeah, in the backyard there was that little uh, little bungalow, then there was the... the the big garage and another shed that yes. Pop, um, as Pop's uh, workshop, right? And um, yeah, three workshops. Um, oh, three workshops. Yeah. Yes, um, Umpy's bungalow he turned into a workshop uh, after Umpy died, and oh, okay. um, then he had the. Um, there was a, a a big building, and it was a double sized garage in 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 the area. Yeah. Um, that I actually drew up the plans for to submit oh, to the okay. council, and there was um, a, a third workshop which um, was over on the other side of the, the block of land. It, um, it 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 had a lane running down the the back. It was a big block of land. It was um, seventy five feet by one hundred and sixty. Uh, seven, 75 by 165 feet, so around about a quarter acre in in area, mm -hmm. and um, a, a nice gentle slope from from top to bottom. Yeah. And he had um, I'm sorry, I've lost it. Yeah, uh, so uh, so Pop's work was um, what, what did he do? Did he, he was manufacturing? Um, in from home, uh, yes. making things. Yeah, my, was... my dad was a pretty versatile, versatile person. He um, he was basically a salesman, mm -hmm. um, and he but he um, he manufactured flounder spears, um, shooting spotlights, um, squid jigs, uh, rifle magazines. Um, he imported fish hooks from Norway and, and sold them. Oh, right. He, um, he had quite a, a number of replacement parts that people lose. Like people, I don't know how, but they lose magazines from their, um, from their rifles. And around about that time, um, oh, okay. lots of people had firearms for um, the means of getting food. Even in Melbourne, in, in the suburbs of Melbourne. Yeah. Wow. So Blackburn was an outer suburban area. Box yeah. Hill was the end of the metropolitan area. And then you, you got into Blackburn and Blackburn uh, had a series of orchards and dairy farms and yeah. well, small dairy farms, and mixed farms. Um, so it was, um, it was an area where um, you could go out and shoot rabbits and stuff like that when I was a child. Did you ever do that? Not in Blackburn, but I used to shoot, we used to go out on Saturdays 
up to Yarra Glen and walk along the railway line and shoot rabbits from the railway line. Dad had a friend, George Sheehan, who was an orchardist in Blackburn. Mm -hmm. And um, George Sheehan was a World War I officer, yeah. a veteran. And George Sheehan uh, had a, a Vauxhall car with a running board on the side and uh, an Irish setter dog. And the Irish setter dog didn't get into the car, but it stood on this box on the on the running board, yeah. uh, held in position by a lead, and uh, he would take us up to Yarra Glen and we'd walk along the railway line, shoot rabbits, and the dog would plunge down That's the some. side and grab the rabbit and bring them back to us. No, very good. <laughs> That's funny thinking about that. Shooting from the um, from the railway line. Well, I actually ride my push bike now mm. uh, from Lilydale along the old railway line. It's now a defunct um, railway system, but been turned into um, uh, walking and, and bicycle trails. Has had a oh, lot of very good a lot of uh, old railway oh. lines in Victoria. Yeah. Oh, okay. So very close to that area. Yeah. Now, and um, so move, moving to Mutter, yeah. uh, your mother, so that's Frida Francesca... Frida Francesca Hermina Bia, Hermina Bia. her maiden name. Yeah, and so she, she's the, the daughter of Umpy and um, Francesca Haas. Uh, right. Did you know um, the Haas family at all? Yes. Um, yeah. I knew various members of the Haas family. Um, Haas is a, a very common name in Germany, apparently. It's a right. bit like Smith and Brown were out here years ago. Yeah. Um, and there were a lot of them in the Bad Kreuznach area. I actually went to Bad Kreuznach um, in the early 50s, yeah. and I met up with some relatives, uh, Heinz Haas and his wife, uh, um, Monica and yeah. his sister. Sorry, I've forgotten. Were, were they easy to track down? This is post war, uh, post uh, Second World War. Well, so. I didn't track them down initially. Yeah. Um, Gus Beer, who was my grandfather's nephew, mm. he uh, was a World War II veteran and he went over to Germany and he tracked them down. And he gave me their addresses, and that's how I found them. Yeah. I actually lived in Saarbrücken. Mm -hmm. And I went from a Rover Scout moot in Switzerland to Saarbrücken, hitchhiked my way there. And uh, when I got there, I found out that they were in Bad Kreuznach, so I had to backtrack to Bad Kreuznach to find them. Oh, okay. And they were staying um, at the home of um, his sister and... And, yeah. and how, how did they fare um, after the war? With it was, it was I, of course, the war was a very traumatic period. But you well, know, I don't know. No, no one, no one wanted to talk about the war. Oh, okay. But, but Heinz Haas, uh, he was um, a sergeant in the Wehrmacht, which was the the German army. Yeah. But, um, he was a nice guy. Yeah. And so and. So pre pre so the war started in nineteen thirty nine, so you would have been uh, eight you know, when it started. Mm. So quite young. Do you do you have any, any memories of when the war? Yeah, I, I actually remember my mother coming out to dad and saying, "Eric, a terrible thing has happened. Uh, they've declared war on Germany. Yeah. Germany invaded Poland and." Uh, and Britain has declared war on Germany, and uh, we've declared war on Germany. So um, she said, "I wonder if you'll get called up." Well, he was wanted to volunteer and, and go to war. But he, he would have been thirty-eight, something like it? that. Yeah, but he was. Um, he went to enlist, and they knocked him back because he had knocked knees. Oh, okay. He was very tall, wasn't he? Well, he was um, about six one. Yeah, six one. And so the on the cock side they're quite tall, on the beer side um, well, quite short. My mother short. was barely five feet tall. Yeah, I, yeah, I remember. So I'm, I'm in between. Yeah, I'm about five <laughs> eight. Yeah, well, that's the same as me. There you go. 
And um, so Mutter it, it being of uh, German, German stock, uh, how did the, well, I guess she, she went through two world wars, yeah. uh, you know, as an Australian, but from German descendants. Did any, did she have any, um, any, any problems or anything like that? Um, okay. And anti-German sentiment. Well, I, she didn't voice them to me, but mm. I, through um, talking to people and and reading and and what have you, I know that the um, the Haas family went through a lot of trauma in World War One, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the beers um, were similarly affected. Um, my grandfather and his father and his brother were all presidents at various stages of the Turnveron, the German club in Melbourne. Yep. And their names are, are on honour boards um, yep. over, over the years. So they were highly guard, regarded members of the, of the German community. And bear in mind that my father and his brother were, were Australians. They were born in, a, in Australia. Mm. So, um, uh, I think just the name, the, the, the foreign name was sufficient to um, turn people against them to yeah. some extent. But um, my, my grandfather and was a very delightful old man. Yeah, yeah. So, and so, um, yeah, I, I remember at one stage uh, telling me that um, at, when she was at school, she was, um, you know, she was bullied a bit probably purely because of her name. So she's got a very, very uh, oh, German, German name. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. So on the, on the Cox side, so um, you, you mentioned Pop had a brother, um, Jim. Uh, no. No? You're talking on my mother's side. Jim, Jim Beer uh, is, is Rudolf Beer. That's right, yeah. And he was, he was her brother. Yeah. Um, she also had um, um, Carl Beer. Carl Ludwig Bernard Beer was her, also her full brother. Yeah. And uh, the third one was um, was Rudolf Beer, who later was known as Jimmy Beer, and he was a professional cyclist. Mm -hmm. I was a very good cyclist. Yeah. Oh, the Australian record holder. Yeah. Pressure's on you, not me. <laughs> right. So tell me about um, Pop's family. So that's Eric John Cox. Yeah. Well, Eric John Cox uh, was the eldest of a family of uh, one girl and three boys and two boys. Well, three boys. Four boys. I'll get it right. <laughs> um, and he, um, his father, um, Henry, yep. uh, had been married three times. Uh, his first two wives uh, predeceased him. Um, yep. And uh, he, he and, his, uh, and his present wife at that time, Rachel, lived in... I think it was number 14, Law Street, Hawthorne. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he used to sit on his front veranda in a Edwardian home. It was a wooden building that no longer exists. And he would, uh, he, would he had been an employee of the Melbourne and Metropolitan Tramways Board. And there was a tramways board depot at Hawthorne, which I believe he worked at clerk of some description and he would sit on his um, veranda with a fob watch and he would time the the trams as they went uh, as they went past and he'd say that tram is 30 seconds late so this is a long time after he'd retired a long time after he'd retired <laughs> he was um he had a gammy leg of some description i don't know what what the cause was mm -hmm. and he also had a cast eye uh, 
So it's a bit like Marty Feldman. One eye went one way and the other <laughs> eye went straight forward sort of thing. Oh, okay. And um, he, um, but he was a very kindly fellow. And during the course of his life, he, although he had a, um, a relatively poor paid position, I would imagine at that time, mm. he um, managed to um, accumulate several houses and uh, he uh, oh, okay. was quite a successful person in, in that regard. Was he on the share market, uh, playing on the share market I, or was just I, I don't good, know. good, I don't know where the... Good salesman like Pop. I've got no idea. Mm. But he was, um, he was a very kindly person and he, um, I think that he lived frugally, uh, but he was a sports person. He, he loved the cricket and football, and uh, he, um, in fact, Pop played cricket. Um, oh, okay. There's apparently a photo of, of him in the um, um, the old St Kilda cricket ground. Oh, right. Uh, but I haven't I haven't seen it. That's we'll one, it. one of my jobs to go down there and photograph it. But um, he is, um, his, his three wives, the middle one was uh, Amelia Lawton and mm -hmm. she was my father's mother and um, uh, the mother of, um, of his, of all of his children as far as I can see. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and she died at a relatively early age. I, cancer seemed to be the thing that killed them off in those days. In the early 1900s, this would be. Yeah, yeah I guess so. Yeah. And uh, Pop was born in 1901, and he died in 86 or 87. Yeah. Uh, he was um, a very, a very pleasant person. He was very very quiet, uh, but he was uh, um, astute. He, mm. uh, he provided well for his family and he, um, um, he was a good husband, certainly a good father. Um, Shirley was sent to a, um, a private school, an expensive school in Fentner in um, uh, Camberwell. Didn't she start a day um did she go to a Catholic school? She went to a convent. Convent, right. Yeah, she started off her school life in Blackburn South State School, where I originally went to school. Yeah. We both went there. Uh, and um, she um, she was a bit hard to control, apparently. And oh, okay. My auntie Lett, um, who was a physical culture teacher, um, she said to Mother, I think that what Shirley needs is to go to a convent and be taught by the nuns. Oh. Uh, the nuns are very good disciplinarians and they will be able to <laughs> whip her into shape anyway. So. Okay, so Kevin, you're saying that you're a very good son, you know, very, very well uh, behaved, but Shirley was not <laughs> because you stayed at the state school. Yeah, I, I would say that probably that's correct. <laughs> I would say that's probably correct. Okay, so... Okay. so like we, it, there's no escaping the, the issue. My my uh, my sister is bipolar, mm -hmm. so she has a different um, a, a different makeup to myself. I'm not saying that's good or that's bad, but uh, there is a reason for her uh, her behaviour mm -hmm. from time to time. So most of the time she's fine. Yeah, all of the time. Uh <laughs> Now, uh, so she went to the convent, and then at some some point she went to, um, and I, I think I've been told the story, but I can't remember. She she they she had to move from the convent to Fintana. Was it a religious uh, reason? The reason that they gave at the time was that they had insufficient space for Catholics, so they had to tip out all of the non Catholics. Non -Catholics. And that's probably right. And and so the, your religion then, or the family's religion, was uh, Church of England. Church of England, yeah. Originally, yeah. they uh, they were Catholics. Uh, uh, on Mutter's side, the German side. Yes. Yeah. And the Cox side was uh, Church of England. So no, no, they no? were Presbyterian. Oh, 
So we went midstream. <laughs> okay, so okay, so I guess you had to pick pick uh, a, a compromise. I guess so. Yeah. Okay. And so so then she was at Fintana for a um, for the rest of her schooling years. Yeah, I, she I was guess. a good student there. Yeah. And, and she um, she did well at school. She. Um, uh, had a desire to become a nurse and she worked at the Box Hill Private Hospital which is no longer not, no longer there and she um, then did training at the uh, Royal Children's Hospital and um, she worked uh, at a, um, a doctor's clinic um, up and for a period after she was married and then she had a number of children but she was um, she was a good mother and uh, she um, academically um, she she was quite bright if she put a mind to it <coughs> now now you you had a, a hand in um, introducing mum with uh, dad yes Bruce yeah well the the first Thing that I can recall is that um, I was Shirley's partner at a Deb Deb ball and, and practices. Mm -hmm. and they had debutante balls in the various town halls, and the um, uh, debutantes <coughs> would be uh, have coming out procedure, and they'd be introduced to the um, to the local mayor and his wife, and they would dance. So would this be when Mum was sixteen or eighteen, or well, probably about sixteen or seventeen? Yeah. And um, so I was her partner for this, and Bruce and his sister was the partner of uh, Patricia, his sister. Yeah. Um, so it was. Um, I think that was probably the first time that they met. But Bruce was also um, the scoutmaster. Uh, for what? Uh... Uh, uh, well, it wasn't a scoutmaster, he was the rover leader yeah. of the um, the first Blackburn um, rover. rover group and, and uh, he lived at Mitcham but um, he had a friend Arthur Harvey who later became a uh, an Anglican minister um, who um, said why don't you join the scouts and um, so Bruce did that and he used to ride his, his treadley from um, his home in Dunlavin Road, Mitcham, down to the Blackburn Scout Hall, and that was when I first met him. Okay. Later on, we became exceptionally uh, firm friends, and uh, uh, I regard him as an older brother. Oh, very good. Hey, were you both in Scouts or, or both in Rovers? Did you both or in did Rovers you... together? He so was, you didn't? He, was, he wasn't in the Scouts, as no. I recall. He may have been, but I don't. You were I don't in think Scouts. So. I you... was in the Scouts. I yeah. was a Queen Scout. And okay. And and so so dad so you were both in rovers together and and dad was the um, the uh, the rover leader. He was the assistant rover leader at the time. Charlie yeah. Hume was the rover leader, and, and yeah. Bruce was his assistant at the time. Yeah. Later on, Charlie moved um, moved to Ringwood, I think, and, uh, and Bruce became the rover leader for a number of years. Okay. He did and a fantastic job as rover leader. Yeah, oh, very good. And and that, and so you would have had lots of contact with dad, and then oh, and, and mum and dad uh, met. Yes. And it was... So, uh, pop, you, you said pop had uh, in pop's family there were uh, four boys and one girl, and that's right. Yes. And um, so, did you know? Um, the uh, Pop's brothers and sister? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, he was probably the closest member of the family to Pop was his sister Ruth. Yeah. And Ruth was a lovely person. She was a big girl. She was about five foot eleven or something like that. All the Coxes were tall. Yeah. In fact, uh, his brother Percy was um, six foot six. Oh, wow. And they called him Stretch. <laughs> Wonder why. <laughs> for, for obvious reasons. Uh, but they're all over six feet tall. Yeah. And um, uh, he, um, uh, Pop's other brothers, um, Pop was the eldest in the family, then there was Percy, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. um, then there was Ruth, and then there was Joe. Joe was the, the youngest member of the family. Now, Joe married um, a lady from Blackburn during the Depression. Her name was Amy Dashwood. Yeah. Um, and her father worked on the local council, which was regarded as being a, um, a menial sort of a job, I guess. And um, uh, I don't know that Pop had a lot of time for the Dashwoods, but so be it. Uh, uh, Pop um, um, had a falling out with the family. The whole family? No, not with the whole family. No had a falling out with Joe because okay. um, uh, Joe was the favourite of, of Pop's Father. stepmother oh, okay. and um, somehow or other she had manipulated that Joe get the best house that, um, that they had so instead of um, when he died splitting up the dividends of all of the houses and distributing them equally. I see. What he did was to um, uh, will or bequeath the best house, which was a, a brick home in Orange Grove, St Kilda, mm. very valuable property to, to Joe, and um, the other houses were all uh, spread between the rest of the family, and they were of lesser value. So Joe yeah. came out on top of the whole thing. Well... <laughs> What happened was that Amy, Joe's wife, um, got Joe to write to the uh, to the um, uh, what do they call the people at um, executors of the will, yeah. uh, of which Pop and Charlie were the executors, asking for money to paint the inside of the house at Orange Grove out. Well, that was the finish of uh, of talks between. <laughs> Yeah, that's a fear for us. That, that branch of the family. And that rift uh, mm. continued right up to the time I actually went to a funeral uh, of, I um, can't recall who it was at the time, but it was at, at the crematorium. Yeah. And um, uh, Joe was there and... Um, I said to Dad, you've got to go and talk to your brother. And he said, I'm not going. Wow. And I said, you've got to let it go, Dad. And uh, I made them shake hands. Oh, good. So that... Um, so they did re reconcile of sorts? Well, I don't... Yeah, of, of sorts. Mm. And uh, later on, Joe said to me that Amy did he really did the wrong thing and mm. um, forcing him to write about this thing. And I've later... Spoken with with um, with with Joe and Amy's son, who is um, he lives in Morwell, and he is um, an electrical. Well, he was an electrical engineer with the SEC, and he um, he said that his mother did the wrong thing about the the house business, and Joe got the pick of all of the the furniture of the house, and there were some wonderful pieces of furniture, including a billiard table. Yeah. And Joe got the billiard table, and um, the rest scrambled for what they got, I guess. Wow. It's sad when that happens. Oh, it's ridiculous. Sort of tears the family apart. Well, wills can be a, a dreadful source of... Um, yeah. If they're not done properly, they uh, cause endless trouble. Mm. Well, they should be very, very simple, um, wills. But... Um, so, so, so you're talking about the the death of um, Pop's father, which was Henry. Um, uh, do you, did you know any of your grandparents um, on on either side? Did you? I knew Henry. Shirley and I used to go and visit him. Oh, but, uh, sorry, I don't mean. Um, uh, sorry, great grandparents. No, 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 I didn't. But I, I have visited the grave of uh, of Henry's father, uh, which was John Cox, and mm -hmm. he's in the Faulkner Cemetery. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've also visited um, Umpy's grave, which is in the 
Burgara Cemetery at, at Kew. Oh, okay. I and didn't I've realize references that. References of the plots of where they are. Is, is there a headstone there? Sorry. Is there a headstone? Yes. Yep. In both of them, oh, okay. I don't believe. And uh, when I, I, I'm doing much the same as you, Alice, doing family history stuff, and uh, I discovered that um, that my grandfather Henry Cox and um, his brother uh, Edward and, mm -hmm. and his wife um, are buried in the, um, or one of his wives, are buried in the um, Kew Cemetery, in the um, Brighton Cemetery. Okay. So I went to, um, went to the various authorities and got permission and I've taken over two grave plots there um, and I'm the custodian of them and um, with the consent of my cousins who are the only other lawful claimants to the site um, I now and they don't want it um, are, um, I'm going to get buried there my ashes will be buried there and so will um, so are my wife's and uh, my late wife Olive and mm -hmm. uh, Philip's indicated that he, my son, that he wishes to be buried there too. Oh, okay. where his head remains. Yeah. Oh. Right. Always wanted good. a plot of land in Brighton. It's a very <laughs> select suburb. I presume it's a reasonably small plot. <laughs> well, it's not the largest holding oh. in the uh, yeah. in the city. Hmm. So go, going back um, to the. To going back to um, Main Street, yes. um, so the war the war has started and you're at school, and um, mum's at at school there. I remember the stories of um, so obviously the World War Two was a you know a huge um, a huge thing, and I remember um, you know stories of um, pop making. Uh, a bomb shelter or bomb shelters there. Yes. Do you remember, um, you know, Pop uh, digging out the, or creating a, a bomb shelter there? Well, he actually created two. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's one in the in the floor of one of his workshops, um, and uh, it was a relatively small thing, about the size of a grave, I guess. It wasn't very big. What? And uh, for uh, one person or? Oh, I, you know, I don't think it would have fitted more than one person, really. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't a substantial structure by any means. And it was... Um, it, it was... Um, it was bomb shelter number two. The first one was under a carport in, um, in the backyard. And that was deemed to be a bit dangerous, so he filled that one in and built, dug this other one out. <laughs> But it later on became a, uh, a site for he used to um, brew home brew, home brew, oh, home brew okay. beer. Very clever. And uh, mum, uh, I think mum was saying that it filled up with water when it when it rained. Uh, one one of them. Yeah. Probably I don't remember that. Yeah. So do you rem do you remember the the feeling of the time? Yeah, you know, whether you know we're, we're Australia was going to be invaded at the drop of a hat and. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The, the so attack it. on Sydney Harbour by the um, three Japanese midget submarines uh, created great consternation and people were um, uh, leaving the cities and um, lots of people had country houses that the, uh, that the families were all um, sent to and mm -hmm. um, the breadwinner would stay in the, in the city earning a living and um, that was... That was the norm for the day. It yeah. was, um, I, I won't say there was widespread panic, but um, mm -hmm. there was great concern that the, the evil Japanese would would come down here and um, invade the place. I was read, reading about that uh, just just recently, and they were, they were talking about reconnaissance um, flights of the Japanese, um, and apparently uh, there, there was one or two around Melbourne uh, as well. You know, flights take, know. taking off from um, uh, submarines, which is which is quite amazing. So um, then, so so you're at school all, all through uh, World War Two. 
Do you remember the end of World War Two? Yeah, perfectly. That was in 1945. Yeah. Um, there were two ends of World War Two. There was the, the victory in in Europe and VE Day, victory mm -hmm. in Europe, and then uh, subsequently um, when they dropped the um, the bombs and um, Nagasaki and uh, Hiroshima, yeah. that heralded the end of the war in the Pacific, and that was VP Day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember VP Day was widespread celebrations, and people went into the city, and um, there was a, a victory parade, and uh, it was. Um, celebrations like of which have not been seen since. Yeah. And were you, um, so how old were you just working it out? I was you about were, 12, I think. 12, okay, so had 12 14 or something. And you finished school uh, when you were 17 or 18? Yeah, I went to, um, first of all, Blackman South State School, which is mm -hmm. no longer there. Um, then I went to Box Hill Technical School. Yeah. Um, and then I went to Swinburne Senior Technical College, which subsequently became Swinburne University and whatnot. And that was at the Glen Ferry campus. Yeah. And uh, I um, I did the first year of the mechanical engineering diploma, and I really didn't work hard at all because I had been selected to go to a a scout jamboree in France. So I was just marking time and I wasn't studying or doing anything except filling in time. Looking forward the to the, uh, yeah, the looking trip. Looking forward to going to France. Mm. Anyway, they cancelled the, uh, the thing, so I'm left in a real heap of trouble. So I had to um, study. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't good enough. I didn't, uh, I didn't make it. So at the end of the year, your dad said, well, looks as though you're going to have to repeat that year. And I said, no, I'm <laughs> not going to do that. I'll get a job. What do you want to be? I said, I don't know. He said, well, look, I think we'd better go and get you uh, assessed to find out what's suitable for you. So um, I was assessed and they thought that I'd probably make a good turner and fitter. So mm -hmm. I um, he's organised a uh, an in interview for me at uh, General Motors. He said, I hear they're going to make an Australian car and... Uh, at Fisherman's Bend, and uh, during the war, Dad had worked at Commonwealth Aircraft, which was just down the road from Fisherman's Bend. Yeah. And so he, know where, he knew where the General Motors plant was and whatnot. So I had an interview with a guy who was the employment officer, Harry Beard, and he employed me. Uh, but he said, There's no vacancies in the control room yet, you'll have to wait six months. But he said, I can. I can get a job for you in the meantime as a plant operator. So I got a job as a plant operator in Plant 5 making shock absorbers for Chevrolets and Pontiacs. Yeah. And Buicks, they were the cars of the day that were imported from America. And um, it was, uh, I was there for about six months or so before the tool room vacancy presented itself and uh, I then commenced and completed a five-year apprenticeship and um, in the tool room yeah. and became a, um, a tool maker. And so so the, the trip to France was just a very short trip then, the, um, the Scout Jamboree? Well, it would have been, except I didn't make it a short one. Mm. I hopped on a boat and, and went to England. I didn't travel with the main contingent. And uh, I went to um, I went to England, and um, I uh, I lived on board the Discovery, which was Captain Scott's old ship, which was um, uh, moored on the Thames outside Temple Station at okay. the time. It's since gone back to Scotland where it was built. Is this this um, was it Robert Scott the the Antarctic explorer? Yeah. Is that it? Oh, okay. Uh, well, a wonderful old ship, uh, huge oak beams in it and and what have you. Mm. Uh, but it had blown its boiler at some stage or other and it was no longer a working ship. Yeah. 
but it's now a museum that's, that's in Dundee. Um, so I lived on board that and uh, I went to scout headquarters and said, look, I'm not a member of the contingent, the Australian contingent that's coming across. I've uh, come in before it. Yeah. And uh, But what I would like to do is go to the coronation. And um, So this, this is in 1952? 53. 53. And then I said, um, uh, can you get me a ticket for the coronation? He said, I can do better than that. He said, um, they want... They want scouts to man the door of um, the Earl Marshal's office, and he's the guy that organises the um, the coronation. It's up to you. Mm. We can get you the job there. There were only two of us. The other one was an Englishman. Mm. And uh, so I used to um, open the door for the dignitaries that came in, one of whom was Lord Louis Mountbatten. Oh, right. And uh, I... Um, used to act as a courier riding a push bike around London delivering letters mm. uh, to Buckingham Palace, to um, horse guards, to lifeguards, to uh, Admiralty, all over the place. It they was, had you working working hard. Yeah, oh, it was very exciting. Yeah. Very exciting riding a push bike around London, I can tell you. <laughs> <Would have been. laughs> Even in those days, there was yeah. plenty of traffic. Yeah, no bike paths. No. So I worked there for about five weeks mm. and I got a ticket for the final rehearsal in uh, Westminster Abbey, which was wonderful. The only persons that weren't there was the Queen and, uh, and Prince Philip. Yeah. The rest of them were... Um, were the, so all of the pageantry and the colour and what have you was evident at that. Yeah. And for the actual day of the coronation, which was a foul day, yeah. I had a seat... Um, on the Strand just outside Buckingham Palace. It's oh, just, perfect. It, just, yeah, it was perfect. When you say foul day, so uh, it was, was it raining? It was bloody rain. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, they don't show that on the uh, no, TV it was shows. No, cold as can be. And I remember Queen Salotti of Tonga was in a, an open Landau and um, she had a bare arms, you know. Yeah. She'd come from Tonga and... <laughs> to the cold, very of, cold of London and it's raining and she's dressed in all of her um, ceremonial yeah. gear which um, wouldn't have been warm I wouldn't have thought mm. but she was a huge woman so probably it wouldn't penetrate the yeah <laughs> had a um, insulation layer yeah <laughs> yeah very good So what happened after the coronation, Kevin? <laughs> after the coronation, I, um, I, I, I had a push bike, of course, in, in London. It was, mm -hmm. a, um, it was a beautiful bike. And I um, had a friend, uh, Jack Cram, who came over on the same ship as I did from Australia, which was the SS at Tranto, uh, the SS um, Esperance Bay, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Esperance Bay was a 13,500 tonne um, cargo passenger vessel, uh, one of the old Aberdeen and Commonwealth line ships that Billy Hughes had set up in Australia. And uh, he, uh, this particular ship had a sister ship called the, um, the Jarvis Bay, and the Jarvis mm -hmm. Bay was um, designated as a, a light cruiser, and it had one gun mounted up forward, mm. and uh, uh, it was guarding a convoy of ships, and uh, the German battleship, um, the Graf Spey, uh, oh, yeah. attacked the, um, the convoy, and Captain Fogarty Fegan, who was the um, the skipper of the of the Jarvis Bay, um, pointed his ship at the um, the German pocket battleship and yeah. um, blasted away with his little gun. It made no difference to this great battleship, <laughs> and uh, he was posthumously awarded the the VC for his actions. And uh, what did they sink the Jarvis boat? Oh, yeah, they sunk it all right, blew it out of the water. 
but the um, the bulk of the uh, the convoy escaped. So I don't know how we got onto that. <laughs> but I um, after the the coronation was over, uh, I uh, went over to um, I was on my way to the to the uh, to the Rover Scout mood in Candace in Switzerland mm -hmm. and John Cramp and I uh, rode our push bikes. We went by train to Southampton, uh, offloaded, um, went across the ferry to um, to France, um, hopped on the bikes and then rode them to Paris and that took a couple of days. And then we stayed there for about a week and then we went from Paris to Orléans and then down to tours, by which time uh, Jack Cramp, who perhaps wasn't as fit as I was, um, decided that he had enough of push bike riding and I agreed that that was a good idea. So we sent the bikes back to England and I, um, I we, we then decided that we we're going to hitchhike. Well, it was impossible to get a lift from where we were. So we caught a train to Spain bought a uh, 3,000 kilometre rail ticket in Spain and went from um, went to Madrid and then to Barcelona and then to uh, uh, the Mediterranean side and travelled around to um, the, the French and Italian Rivieras to uh, finally to Pisa and we tried to hitchhike from there We'd managed to hitchhike our way through all of that after the train ticket in Spain. Mm -hmm. And then we, um, at Pisa, we tried to get a lift and I, I can... Right. So where were we, Kevin? Well, I think we're about halfway across the um, Indian Ocean on the, the cargo vessel coming <laughs> to... to, to um, going on, on its way from Fremantle to Colombo. Yeah. Well, the refrigeration plant uh, broke down and uh, we had to return to Fremantle to get that repaired because they've had a whole cargo of frozen yeah. frozen meat on board. But the, the ship took six weeks and two days to get from Melbourne to, to Southampton and um, it was um, it was it was a very enjoyable trip, I must say. You were kept busy the whole time. Oh, uh, things to do. All the time. Yeah. All the time. It was no cargo ship, but, but, mm. and uh, I think it had about um, I don't know sixty or seventy passengers. Nothing like the blocks of flats that are on the oceans of today. Yeah. But um, uh, after London, I um, I had to get across to Europe to go to the Rover Scout Moot in Switzerland and I think I got you as, I think um, I'd left the, um, uh, my digs on the Discovery which was on, on the River Thames at Temple Station. This is pretty noisy when they got married but I, I do know that um, 56 I think. Only 56? We got married in 57, right. Rob and I. Uh, 56 was the Olympic Games year. That's right, yep. Yeah. That's um, right. Dad Dad said that he was a scout. Uh, he, well, he must have been a rover at that time. Yeah. Hold, holding the medal boxes for okay. when, they were uh, you know, when the medals were um, being presented. Okay. Were you involved in that? Were you no. at the Olympics? No. Yes, I went to the Olympics. I went to the opening of the Olympics, uh, and I um, I went to um, uh, the gymnasium. Uh, yeah, the gymnastics. Gymnastics on one occasion, and I went to the. Um, oh, gee, it's a long way to go. It was um, in the Olympic swimming pool. Mm -hmm. One of the the bench there. Now it was a, a wonderful experience for Melbourne, mm. the Olympic Games. It, um, it was a long time coming, and it's um, it made a huge difference to the sporting facilities in the city of Melbourne, and uh, uh, left quite a profound impression on me. Yeah, uh, quite a privilege to be able to go to Olympic Games in your home city. Absolutely, yeah. We we lived through that in two thousand. Mm. It was a great time. 
And so, so you're married in '57. Not in '57. Yes. Yeah, and um, then um, we we're married, and we had a small home in Blackburn, which was not terribly far from where my parents lived in at, at 50 Main Street. We lived in 4 Hayden Street, which was okay. further down the hill over the creek and around the corner. Yep. And uh, the house has subsequently been demolished. It was a wall service home. Yep. Um, it was uh, not much bigger than 10 squares. Um, and it was um, a fibro construction. It's since gone and they've built another home on the place. We bought the property for about, about 5,000 pounds, I do believe. Uh, and um, I, we sold it for a bit more, not, not a lot more, and moved to another suburb. We moved to Glen Waverley, lived on the corner of um, Waverley Road and uh, Road and I've forgotten, but it was up near the police seminary. Yeah. Seminary, no, I'm sorry, up near the seminary on the hill, which is now the police academy. Oh, okay, and and F Philip was born then. Philip was born yes um, the following year yeah. after we got married. Um, he on the third of October. He's our eldest. We've got two others. Um, so Philip was born in 58, Joanne was born in 60, and Megan was born in 1962. Mm -hmm. And um, and then mum, I'm pretty sure mum and dad married in 56. Could be wrong. I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, it was before, I, I know I drove your mother to the, um, uh, in the wedding car. Oh, okay. And so subsequently um, did it uh, for Fiona and um, more recently for Selena. Yeah. So oh, right. I'm, a, Very good. I'm a part time Uber <laughs> driver. Oh, unpaid. Well, oh, unpaid. Oh, yeah, so you should be chasing your debts then. <laughs> but so, and where were they married? Where was mum and dad uh, married? Uh, they were married in um, St John's Blackburn, I do believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in um, Alfred, Alfred Street. Yeah, St John's Blackburn anyway, at the, yep. um, the Church of England. Mm. And the reception was held at 102 Whitehorse Road, which is now a Katmandu store on the site. <laughs> okay, well, very good. Yeah. And they they immediately moved into uh, Dunlavin Road. Yes, in, they moved into an incomplete inc home. Yeah. But, um, and they lived in the garage and... Um, I do believe Shirley was pregnant um, uh, before too long. Yeah, Fiona was born in '57, so yeah. yeah. And um, so September, uh, oh, on Mum's birthday. Yeah, Shirley and Bruce had had several children, and they all came fairly quickly. Yeah. And um, yeah. So, yeah. So so it was Fiona in '57, Heather in '58. Robert in 59 and then myself in 62. Um, now, so I want, want you to tell me about the, the story of um, your mum uh, had a bike accident uh, which landed her in hospital. Yes. Yeah. Shirley um, was riding um, to a, an evening meeting with a next door neighbour. Uh, oh. His name was Gemmel. Yeah. And, Auntie, um, um... I don't recall his first name. There were several Gemmels, no good good family friends that lived next door. Auntie Jeannie. Yeah, right. in Dunlavin Road. And um, anyway, Shirley got hit by a car and ended up on the, on the curb. A very nasty gash on her knee. Mm. And uh, it. Um, she ended up with gas gangrene. And... Uh, Gas gangrene is a terrible disease. It can kill you, and uh, I think it is um, that horse manure. And there were horses around at the time because of oh. horse, delivery horses that milk and bread and stuff like that they were delivered to the home. So there's still horses around on the streets. Then. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so I guess that's how she got it. And uh, she ended up having 
uh, copious doses of, um, of cortisone, which um, uh, affected her mentally. Yeah. Uh, she had a, a mental condition. Uh, and um, Can you remember what year this is? Was it, well, it um, must have been the year that you were born, I think. So I was born in May uh, 62. Yeah, it was probably then. So I was just a very small yeah. baby then when it happened. And um, anyway, she was in um, in this place and I got a, a phone call that my mother and father were going to visit her. And uh, I, uh, I was at work at the time and I knew that she was in a bad mental state. She had actually been lying in bed uh, for about three days, keeping herself awake by pouring water over her head. Right. And uh, so my mother had only recently had a heart attack. And uh, really. So I, I hopped into the car and I I drove to the to the hospital and had a few words with Shirley and told her that she had to start behaving herself because. Mother was coming, and that yeah. um, mother wasn't well, and uh, didn't want to see her um, in a bad in, state. In a current state, mm. and um, so I was able to get there before my parents got there. And okay, yeah. So how, how long was mum in hospital for? Oh, I, I don't know, but several days. It was the, the Fairfield Infectious Diseases Hospital. Uh, which no longer exists. Yeah. It's something that has some other function now, um, and uh, that's where she was. That's mm. where it was a, a great, in, a great establishment. Mm. But, um, so yeah. j just a few days in in hospital. Oh, she was there for quite a while. Yeah. Oh, for quite a while. Yeah, she had a, a huge gash on her leg. It's, it's seven. The, um, the scars of it today still. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, we have great fun uh, looking at the scars. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I know at that at that time that uh, Fiona and Heather were uh, sent to Grandma and Grandpa to live, mm. and Robert went to the next doors, the the Gemmels. Yeah. And and I went to live with uh, live with you. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. We we used to um, deem that you and uh, our daughter Megan were um, were twins. Um, they were both born in nineteen sixty two, mm. and um, they used to play together nicely. And um, um, we called Alistair Cookie because he <laughs> would continually. Um, it was probably. A, only around about one or something, uh, would get up and walk across to the um, to a cupboard and open it up and grab the um, the biscuit barrels. Now that's why we mm. called him Cookie. <laughs> but they they were well, like, like, like twins. They were almost the same age. Yeah. And c can you remember how long I was with you for? Oh, it was well over a week. Oh, okay. Right. So time. not not a. Not months. Oh, it wasn't months. No, no it, but it was it was weeks. It was yeah. it, it was um, it was quite a while. It would have been a difficult time for Dad. Um, oh, uh, your father was marvellous because your mother had several um, sessions whereby she uh, wasn't coping terribly well, mm. and I think the reason was that she had a lot of children in a very short space of time, and it, it was a huge job to have one child, let alone. Mm. Um, Four. Quite a few of them in, 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 in as many years. Mm. Yeah, very, very difficult, very stressful. But your father was a, a, a tower of strength and he uh, he coped very well. And yeah. He was able to um, to manage well and look after his wife and family. Yeah, yeah. And we all, we were a good family. We yeah. were all good family. We all pulled together and sorted things out. Did you get together very often? Like, like at that stage, all the everyone living in Melbourne. Um, well, a fair bit, yes. We we lived in not adjoining suburbs, but mm, um, very nearby. close by. Mitcham and, and Blackburn are, are quite close suburbs, and uh, I was still involved in the Scouts, and uh, Bruce was Bruce was the, the group scoutmaster at that time, and uh, I can remember going to. 
to um, Dunlavin Road and uh, uh, Bruce would be conducting a, a meeting and he'd have one of the children or babe or whatever it was sitting on his knee feeding it or whatever it was <laughs> and conducting the meeting at the same time. He extremely versatile bloke. Oh, very good. And then uh, shortly after that, Dad got the opportunity to move to Canberra. Yes. And um, so that was about sixty-five, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, either sixty-four, sixty-five, around around then. Yeah, can't, can't yeah. remember at that, that time. Yeah, he worked at the Mint uh, in in Melbourne in William Street, mm. and um, it was interesting. The I worked for a guy. Uh, Ken Wallace Crabb, he was a group captain in the RAF during World War Two, yeah. and uh, his son, uh, Chris Wallace Crabb, who became a professor, an English professor at uh, Melbourne University, was one of his sons, and um, but before Chris um, uh, became a um, an academic, he mm. actually worked for Bruce at the Mint as a, oh, right. a metallurgy um, trainee. Yeah. But I went to the Mint one day and uh, Bruce showed me around. It was yeah. most interesting. Yeah, well, very good. I, I know it was a big opportunity for Dad. You know, it was probably a, a promotion plus oh, you know, so. getting getting to set up the new the new Mint. Absolutely. How, how did um, Mutter and Pop take uh, the, you know, Shirley was moving away, moving out of Melbourne for a long, you know, a long way away, basically. Well, I, I, I think that they were very pleased that Bruce had got a, a, a promotion and it was a, a wonderful opportunity and, and whatnot. Mm. And um, they, they used to go to Canberra a lot. Yeah. And um, the McLennans built a big house and downstairs there was... Um, an area that was like the size of a flat with a with a, a kitchen and various other things. So um, uh, my dad had his own business and he was able. He was very good at time management, and yeah. um, so they used to go there. So they saw a lot. When you're living in the same house as a person, you probably see a lot more of them than you mm. would if you were uh, lived in nearby suburbs where yeah, there were all possibly. sorts of other distractions. Mm. Yeah. You know, so that was. That was fine. Yeah, oh, very good. I used to go there a few times too. You did, hmm. I remember. Yeah, you know, it was, I think at that time, it was generally um, every Christmas, Christmas would either be, you know, the whole family goes down to Melbourne, you know, the McLennan's going down to Melbourne, or, um, you know, people coming uh, coming up to, to Canberra sure. for Christmas. So that was always good. It was always good. Yeah. Um. So going going back to um, Pop's family, uh, Pop Pop's uh, father was um, uh, Henry Cox. Yes. And mother, uh, what what was uh, Pop's mother's name? Pop's yeah. mother's name was Agnes Matsugora Lawton, mm -hmm. and um, she um, she died at a relatively early age. And uh, the children uh, were brought up by a, their stepmother. Uh, what was her name? I'm sorry, I don't know. I'll have yeah. to look it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was um, she was uh, not well thought of by the family. And I, I know that Dad and um, and Charlie moved out. And my father was um, apparently instrumental in in um, in paying for the kids to go to school, etc. He was, uh, yeah, he was a very good provider in that regard, even at that early age. Pa paying for his his siblings to go to school? Yeah. Oh, okay. So he was uh, earning pretty well um, oh, he was earning, back yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. His first job was delivering meat on horseback in um, Balaclava or St Kilda. Oh, okay. He only lasted about a fortnight. He didn't like that job much. Why? I don't know. He didn't <laughs> like it. <laughs> well, I guess as a delivery driver. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it was on horseback. It was, uh, you know, 
holding a legal lamb or whatever it might be. And, oh, not on a cart, but no, actually on a horse. On a ho so you have to ride the horse, not yeah. not drive a cart. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's that what makes, I'm told. That makes it even harder, I guess, especially if you're delivering lots of uh, you know lots of goods. Yeah, I heard tell that he dropped a leg of lamb one day and it was all wrapped up in newspaper or whatever it was. And oh, he lovely. Had had to rewrap it before he could deliver it. <laughs> yeah, but then mainly he was uh, self-employed. Like you were saying before that he. Uh, oh, years afterwards. Yeah. Years afterwards, but he had a lot of different jobs. He, he um, at one stage there was a, a department store in Melbourne, not as big as Myers, but it was called Craig mm -hmm. Williamson. Yeah. And Craig Williamson was on the corner of Elizabeth Street and Flinders Street. And um, Dad was in charge of the music department there, and he, um, many years later, I bought a, a piano for the family, and um, I was in the process of buying it, and asked Dad if he'd go with me to have a look at it. We yeah. went to Dandenong and saw this, this piano, and Dad said to the lady, do you mind if I have a look inside? And she said, no, go for it. So he um, was a big man, and he just pulled the piano out from the wall and uh, and he proceeded, to, I reckon he had the whole thing in bits in about um, oh, two or three minutes. Yeah. The whole piano, it sort of folds itself out and yeah. had these parts on the floor and he's checking the, the the felts and pads and stuff like that and he said, oh, it's a good one, Kevin. And he said, I think you should get this one. So he knew a bit about pianos. Oh, he then. knew, a, oh, yeah, and he could, uh, he could play a tune on a piano um, um, Quite well. Yeah, uh, Self-taught. It was. Well, I guess it was just repetition, doing the same thing, mm. like doing the scales. But he could play tunes as well. And and uh, Mutta, before she got married, did she did she work at all? She was a milliner. Milliner. Mm. So hat making hats. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And I think she worked for Hicks. I think it was Hicks Atkinson. I think was the name, and it was a. Um, it was a store, and uh, yeah, she worked in the millinery department. Yeah, and she continued that on um, uh, as in an amateur fashion. I don't think she ever got paid for it at home. Oh, really? And she made hats. Yeah. yeah. In those days, ladies wore hats. Yeah, that's right. Oh, and, and men wore hats too. In fact, I came up on the train yesterday from Melbourne to Sydney, or the day before it was. Sorry, and uh, there was a guy with a a grey felt hat on. Uh, sitting in the train, I thought, well, you're an old bloke because no one wears a hat these days. I, I, I have seen on occasion um, people wearing hats. It's very, very rare, you know, apart from the baseball hats, of course. Of course. Oh, but the, yeah. and the other thing, too, that's changed so much, too. Um, today, people, you very rarely see someone smoking. Mm. But years ago, there were people smoking pipes everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I saw a guy smoking a pipe about three years ago in Marimbula, and I couldn't believe it because I hadn't seen anyone smoking a pipe for donkey's ages. Well, that's a good question. So did, did Mutter and Pop ever smoke? Yeah. Both of them? They both did a bit. Yeah. Um, so just social smoking. Yeah. I used to pinch his cigarettes. Uh, he had a, a jar uh, in, the, in the dining room with a... Um, uh, it was an urn, mm. a, um, a German urn yeah. uh, for decanting um, wine and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, he used to keep his cigarettes in there and I used to pinch them out of there. Umpy, didn't Umpy smoke a pipe? Umpy smoked block tobacco. Oh, okay. And you could buy, um, he smoked a pipe, you could buy this... Um, uh, block tobacco, have lock blocks, and they're about um, or oh, three inches square, I suppose, and uh, about uh, half an inch thick. Mm. And there was a thing called a chopper, and it was a, a blade uh, that came up and down like a guillotine, and you'd thrust the uh, the block of tobacco into it, and you'd you break the tobacco up like that, and then you, okay. you rub it in your hands uh, to loosen it all up, and then you poke it into the pipe, and that'd stain your hands. And away it go. Yeah. Yeah. 
I remember it so sounds like everyone smoked. I know mum smoked mm. until um, the, the 70s. That was one of the things mum said, uh, one of the things that she learnt in, um, in Fintana was how to smoke like a lady. <laughs> oh, get out there, yeah, probably. No, yeah. With one of those cigarette yeah. holders. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. Probably the most important lesson that you learnt at Fintana at that stage, how to smoke like a lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. They were never big smokers. No. Oh, um, I used to smoke too. I smoked until I was about, I don't know, 25 or something, decided it was... Actually, what happened was this. I was married and living in Hayden Street and Dad came around one day and I had a cold, mm. a bad cold. And I'm coughing and spluttering and smoking at the same time. And the old man who had given up smoking by this stage said to me, what are you smoking for? It's coughing and carrying on and all the rest of it. Mm. And he said, I'll tell you what, Kevin, I'll give you a hundred pounds if you give up smoking. I said, oh, yeah. I didn't believe him. So yeah. A week later, he came around and he saw me again. He said, I see you're still smoking. He said, you must be a pretty rich bloke to, to <laughs> knock back 100 pounds. He said, the trouble with you is you've got no willpower. Yeah. And I thought, you old bugger, I'll Try prove you wrong. Up. And I gave up smoking on the spot. Yeah. And, you uh, got your 100 pounds? So oh, sometime later, I said to him, Where's the hundred pounds, Dad? I'll, I'll quit smoking. He said, you've got to quit for a year. Okay. At the That's end of the year, enough. he coughed up the hundred pounds. Very good. And uh, he said, you haven't saved yourself. You haven't just got a hundred pounds. He said, you work out what? That's technical difficulty. He said... Uh, You've saved yourself a hell of a lot more than a hundred pounds, haven't you? And I worked out how much I'd saved, and it was, you know, several times more than that. Really? Wow. Uh, so were... expensive well, when back I gave then. up smoking, uh, Craven A was three and threepence a packet <laughs> of twenty. Three and threepence. I have but, no so idea what you're they talking have. about. Three shillings and and three pence. Yes. That sounds pretty expensive. Now they cost fortune. I, I don't know. Oh, no, that, was, that was it's like fifty dollars a pack or something yeah, ridiculous. That was good, now good quality cigarettes. Yeah. So tell me, what did Pop never offered a hundred pounds to uh, to Mum to stop smoking? Obviously, I don't because know. Because she kept on going. I don't know. <laughs> oh, my wife Olive, she she smoked. And she was just going to give up smoking when I did, and she wasn't able to. Um, for whatever reason, and uh, anyway, um, the grandchildren fixed her up. They said, um, Nana, what are you smoking for? And she said, oh, because I like it. And she said, well, we don't like you smoking because um, smoking kills people and we don't want you to die. So she yeah. quit. She yeah, well, quit then. Very good. But she had to have nicorettes and all sorts of stuff that, that was good. Yeah. Not easy giving up smoking if you become addicted to nicotine. No, ab absolutely. So you did well. You basically went uh, cold turkey. Cold turkey. Oh, God. We're going. It's getting too hot here.